Amen. All right, so if uh, you don't know me, I'm Mike. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my honor to be able to bring the word today. Um, I'd love to meet you. Come down front after the service, and I'd love to shake your hand and just say, hey. So today we're going to be continuing in our second priority series. Uh, we're going to continue talking about what is that second priority, and our first priority is always God, right? It's always God. And we're going to talk about purity today. We're going to talk about struggling to live a life of purity while surrounded by wickedness. So what is purity? Let's start there, right? So purity is this condition or quality of being pure. It's free from anything that contaminates it, pollutes it, none of that, right? It's freedom from immorality, especially sexual in nature, right? So what does pure mean? It means it's unmixed with any other matter, pure heart. So it's unmixed with any other matter. It's free from whatever would pollute it, and it's free from containing anything that it does not properly belong there. So it's free from anything that does not properly belong there. Now in the NASB Bible that I use, you see the word purity five times. You see it four in the New Testament, and you see it once in a proverb. That proverb says this, and I encourage you, they probably put the slide up there about to text for notes. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today. Is that okay? I know we're in church. I think I set a record for the amount of scripture that we're going to talk about today. So follow along, try and stay up. If not, there are notes that you can follow along or the Bible app. So the first one we're going to talk about, he who loved purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as a friend. When you look at this, and I'm a teacher by trade, right? So if you look at this and you dig into that word and the word that's used there in that proverb, that word means pure. It means a clean, pure. And what we're gonna look at is a pure, clean, morally, ethical, pure. Spiritual purity is what we're gonna look at today. So pure motives and a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But what does this look like? What does this look like in our life? What does this look like? Can we see this? Let's go all the way back to the very, very beginning of scripture. Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, pure, he created them. Right after this in Genesis 2, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed pure breath, the pure breath of God into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living person. And then you see in, in Genesis 2, 25, and the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. They were with God in the garden. They were completely naked. Not just physically, I'm talking physically, emotionally, spiritually, completely naked. Total vulnerability to one another. Totally vulnerable. They hid nothing and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed until the moment sin entered this world. When sin entered this world through one man, Adam, we see this. Genesis 2, 25, it says, and the man... And his wife, or uh, in Genesis 3, 8, it says this. Now they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is right after they took of that forbidden fruit. Some of us can't see God, right? We can't physically see God, but we can hear him. I argue with you that if you would just stop and stop looking horizontally at life and every circumstance that comes along and start putting your focus vertically, you'll see him in everything. And if you can't hear him, read your Bible out loud. Read it out loud, you'll hear him. So they, were, they heard God walking throughout the garden. Once they heard him, this is after they disobeyed, this is after they had did something wrong, and they heard him, what did they do? It says the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence 
of the Lord among the trees of the garden. How often do we do the same exact thing? We do something wrong, we mess up, we do something stupid, and instead of running back to the Father, instead of leaning back into his loving arms and running back to him, we try and hide. We try to hide ourselves and there's no hiding. We're not gonna hide from God. You can't put yourself in a corner and hide. But God still loved them so much that he did the first sacrifice in the garden. He did the first sacrifice, clothed them in animal skin and sent them out. No matter what you've done, he's made that last sacrifice already. He sent his son to die on that cross for each and every one of you. If you are in here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, he sent his son to die on that cross for that purpose. You're here for a reason. It's to cover every sin, past, present, and future in our life. But it's not a license to keep sinning as some of us folks try and do. I've got Jesus, I'm good. I know I messed up, but he'll cover it for me. We have to get back to a pure heart. We have to get back to that pure, pure heart. You see, true religion consists in heart purity. How pure is your heart? Those who are inwardly pure show themselves to be under the power of pure, undefiled religion. And true Christianity lies in the heart, in the purity of the heart. The washing of that from wickedness, we must lift up to God, not only clean hands, but a pure heart. See, Romans 12 tells us that we cannot be conformed to this world. We have to be transformed by it. First Timothy says, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. So we're talking about pure and purity and spiritual pure. Is it even possible nowadays to stay pure? To live a life of purity? To be spiritually pure in this wicked, wicked world that's just getting worse and worse and worse? By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. It's quiet. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can stay pure. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit, but you have to make him a priority. You have to make him a priority. God can keep our minds pure in this polluted world, but the answer is not to leave us or to take us out of this world, right? God saved you in this world at this time for a reason, for a purpose. And that purpose is to share the gospel to a lost and hurting world that's getting worse and worse it's to spread the love of Jesus so we don't need to isolate ourselves from this world we need to stop isolating ourselves from this world what we need to do is insulate ourselves from this world we need to put on the armor of God we need to put on those shoes of the gospel of peace to spread that gospel the belt of truth truth the breastplate of righteousness that helmet of salvation that shield of faith we need to pick up then we need to pick up that sword of the spirit, his word. Because his word makes us pure and it sanctifies us. What does that word mean, sanctify? It frees us from sin. It sets us apart, it declares us holy. It's the sanctification process from the moment that you said I'm putting Jesus as my primary, as Jesus is king of kings and I'm chasing after him. It's the sanctification process of making you exactly like him moving forward until the day that you meet him when you do become perfect. John 17, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them away from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I am not asking on behalf of these alone. So not just them, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. We have to abide in Christ. We have to stay connected to him. When we are one with him, then the world knows that you sent me. It's to share the love. They're going to know us by the fruit. John 15, I'm the true vine. 
My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. So, how? How does the word change us? How does the word sanctify us? How does this word make us pure? First, his word rebukes and corrects. His word rebukes and corrects us. Second Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Second, his word warns us to keep away from sin. Psalms 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. And then lastly, his word leads us to obedience. Obedience to God. Psalm 119, later on down. Teach me the way of your statutes, Lord, and I shall comply with it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may comply with your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn my eyes away from looking at what is worthless. Revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Take away my disgrace which I dread for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, revive me through your righteousness. You see, there's an important connection between obedience and the purity of heart. We have to be obedient for that purity of heart. Purify people who are able and ready to do good. That's what he's looking for. Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness. Remember, don't be conformed to this world. Deny ungodliness, worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, in a godly manner in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. We must make a commitment to follow after God's standards. We have to. We cannot look at worldly views. We cannot look at the worldly things, right? We have to deny the ungodliness, as he just said. We have to commit to God's standards. I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. Am I more committed to what God says will meet my needs or doing what I think will meet my needs? And what is going to be your standard of authority? Will I base my life on God's standards or just make up my own standards? So we all know what we're supposed to do. We all know what we're called to do. We all know what's pure, what a pure heart is. Let me give you an example of really not following after the will of God or what I know is right in the essence of this, right? I know in my heart, I'm supposed to love my wife like God loved the church, right? Like Jesus loved the church. He laid down his life for them, right? Gave everything for the church. I'm called to do that. I'm called to sacrifice my wants, my desires for my wife, correct? So this was an anniversary a few years ago and she likes the melting pot. I don't know if you've been to the melting pot. I don't like the melting pot. Whoever invented the melting pot was ingenious. Pay me $40 and cook your own food, right? So... Great plan, but I don't like it. But I was like, you know what? She loves it. I'm going to sacrifice and we're going to go to the melting pot because I know she likes it. No, right? By the melting pot is the St. John's Town Center. In the St. John's Town Center is the Oakley store and I needed new sunglasses. There's always a thing, right? There's always this other motive that can be. There was not a pure heart of let me sacrifice to take rage. Right? There was this, oh, well, that's close to this place and I can get something from that. 
right? But this all starts in our minds. That's what I'm going to talk about, right? This all starts in our minds. We have to manage our thoughts. We have to manage our thoughts. Every temptation begins in your mind, right? The battle's either won or lost at that spot, right? What are you going to do? Anytime you see someone messing up, it didn't just begin with that action. It wasn't just, all oh, that, that action's going to happen, right? They were thinking worldly thoughts, making self-centered choices, I want Oakley's, right? And then produce an emotion. The way you think determines the way you feel. You feel a certain way because you're thinking a certain way. If you start looking horizontally, you're going to start feeling this way because you're going to start thinking this way because all you're seeing is this stuff that's going on and you're not looking vertically and seeing what God's doing in your life. Emotions produce actions long before you act out or act wrong. You are thinking wrong. When I think about this, I always think about don't let your, your surroundings ever dictate how you feel. You dictate how the surroundings are going to feel, right? You don't let that come onto yourself. God tells us to control our thoughts, to humble ourselves before the Lord. He'll make straight our paths. We're called to follow his will. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. James 4. Submit therefore to God, but resist the devil. He will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In James 4, later on. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such a city. Spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. For you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him, it is sin. So often in our minds, we get busy trying to plan and plan and plan and all these things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. Instead of just listening to what God has for each and every one of us. I'm not saying planning's wrong. Like we still have to plan. We still have to do stuff. However, sometimes we try to put our own ways, our own thoughts, our own things into it. Instead of truly just sitting down, resting in the Father and saying, what is it that you want me to do? What is my manna for today? And be satisfied with that. But we can't just resist, resist, and resist, right? We need to replace, refocus as well. What do I mean by that? Whatever gets your attention is going to get you. Sometimes you need to run away. Sometimes you need to do a 180, turn yourself completely back around, and run back to the cross. You need to run yourself back to the cross. But how can I resist, refocus all my thoughts, and try and maintain a pure heart, a spiritually pure lifestyle. In today's world, what I would argue is the one thing that's driving us away from a pure heart, a pure lifestyle, is your media intake. It's your media intake. How much are you taking in? Just as important as it is what you feed yourself, I know I need to watch what I feed myself. I truly do. What you feed your mind is just as important. If all I do constantly is feed myself with junk food and no healthy things, right, spiritually, mentally, I'm going to be wrecked. I have to feed myself healthy. We need to minimize the opportunity for temptation. Don't place yourself in those situations that you know are going to tempt you. If you have trouble with alcohol, don't go to the bar. I, I think of it as a bird story that I talk about. We can resist, we can, we can do all these things, we can remove all these temptations, we can get rid of Facebook, all the phones, we can go back to regular, what the Blackberry phones that you used to type on, right? We can go back to all these things, we call them dumb phones, I think, right? Because things are smartphones. We can go back to all this stuff, but if a bird flies over your head, you can't, I mean, you can shoot the bird, but it's probably going to be frowned upon. If this bird flies over your head, what are you going to do? You can't stop this bird from flying over. The question is, do you keep looking at the bird? you keep going back to it? Do you keep focusing on it? 
Or does this bird just fly over and then you continue on your day and you keep moving your stuff away, right? The enemy's going to try and put these things in your wet path. But what do you do to resist it, right? Do you just keep going, keep moving, and keep focusing on the Lord? How can I minimize temptations? Recognize the situations that tempt you, like I said. Choose your friends carefully. Choose friends carefully. Don't be unequally yoked. I'm not saying not to go out to the lost and hurting world. What I'm saying is don't be unequally yoked. Facebook has ruined the word friends. You do not have 2,000 friends. You don't. I'm sorry. You have 2,000 acquaintances. Your friends are the ones that are going to truly be there for you through the thick and the thin and to always be by your side. And when you call, they pick up, they answer, and they're there. They drop what they are doing just to sow into you. And I don't mean just to tell you what you want to hear. They're there to tell you the things that you need to hear. So when you get mad at them, they're okay, they understand, right? That's your true friend and that's what you need. A friend that's going to put you back on the pathway of purity. Not to see you going down and going, oh, look at this guy going down. To put you back on the pathway of purity. So we need to repent repent and repent receive God's forgiveness Psalm 32 how blessed is he whose wrongdoing is forgiven whose sin is covered how blessed is a person whose guilt the Lord does not take into account and in whose spirit there's no deceit listen to this next part when I kept silent about my sin my body wasted away through my groaning all day long For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality failed as with the dry heat of summer. But now listen to this. I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not hide my guilt. I said I will confess my wrongdoings to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my sin. And then we need to refocus and replace. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. In this world, that's one of the big things about everybody right now. The anxious, anxious, anxious. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That means come lay it at the altar and leave it at the altar. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's turning your focus from horizontal to vertical. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All right. I'm going to make some people mad. He just talked about focus on whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is honorable. There is nothing pure about Halloween. There's nothing pure about Halloween. It is straight evil. I don't care if you're doing trunk and treat. I don't care if you're dressing somebody up as Moses. Do the research and look back on it. Figure out what a jack-o'-lantern is. Figure out what trick-or-treat is. Figure out what a costume is. Figure out all the stuff. There's nothing pure about it. Go back and listen to Pastor Eric's message. I loved Halloween and that thing changed and transformed me. It was the word that changed and transformed me. All right. It's rooted deep in darkness, deep. But what does pure religion look like? It looks like this. James 1, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans, widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Do not be transformed by the world. That's what pure religion looks like. 
All right, Matthew 25. Les, you can come back up now. Matthew 25. This is what it looks like. This is Jesus talking about it right here. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, feed you, thirsty, give you something to drink? And when, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison, come to you and the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these, brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. And I would argue right here what he's talking about, I love Journey Out, I love Clara White, I love all the serve aspects of it. We have to do that aspects, right? I love all of that. But what I, what I see him talking about here is when you're doing this from a pure heart, pure motives, and you're doing this on a daily basis, not having to sign up for something or go to an event, you're just doing this to whoever it is that you run into on that day. They didn't even know they were doing it. I know when I'm serving at Journey Out, I know when I'm doing this stuff, right? It's just from a pure heart, a pure motive. It's just who they are and that's what they're doing. Galatians 6, brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And that law he talks about in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are not going to save you. But I'm telling you that's a guardrail that's gonna put you on the path to find that narrow gate that I talked about before. They didn't go away, they weren't abolished, they were fulfilled. You see, his word, all of his word leads us to a pure heart. And I would argue when we talk about his word, this is what we're talking about. John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of mankind and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not grasp it. Would you rise to your feet? So as we close, I want to show you what the word is, why the word is so important. Listen to me, John 1 and Genesis 1 start the exact same way, in the beginning. In the beginning, and it's no just coincidence. You see, in Genesis, God spoke everything into existence. And then in John 1, the word was with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, not even one thing came into being. You see everything, past, present, future, everything in all of eternity points to the word. It's always pointed to Jesus Christ, amen? That is the word that's gonna change you, transform you, give you a pure heart. So if you're in here today and you haven't given your life to Christ, you're here for a reason. The altar team's gonna be up front. I would invite you to come down to the front and pray with one of them. You see, in the beginning, everything was created perfect in the garden. They were with God walking in the garden. And by the second, or by the third chapter, sin entered this world because of disobedience. Because all Satan had to do was get them to question the word. How often is the world trying to get us to question the word? From that moment forward, God was on a restoration path to bring his son, that rescue plan that needed to happen. 
He had to make that one-time sacrifice for each and every one of you in here. So if you're in here, and you're like, I don't know, I've messed up. I don't have a pure heart. Can I tell you, you don't need a pure heart right now. He accepts you just the way you are. Ephesians 2.8 tells us it's for by the grace of God you have been saved through faith. Not of your own doing, so that no one may boast. But what he's going to do is he's going to clean you up from this point forward. He's going to put people around you from this point forward for the restoration for the time when he comes back or when you see him face to face. And then he'll give you that pure heart. But the best part about it is, if you're a believer in here or if you're making that decision today, when the Father looks down from heaven at this point and you are a son or daughter, he sees you as pure. Even though we don't feel it down here, he looks at you, he looks to Jesus and he sees you pure, white as snow with no sin. And then one day he's going to come back and it's going to be soon. You can see it. So I encourage you, if you want to rededicate your life with every head bowed right now and all the eyes closed, if you want to rededicate your life today, or if you want to make a commitment to follow after him I want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with. If there's anybody in here at all 